Now, last time, we had just started Numbers chapter 21. and in, in this chapter, we see a continuation just full of difficulties of the Israelites' journey towards their promised land, Canaan. Now, the king of Edom had refused to allow them to pass through his territory, the most preferred route that would, have, would take the people to just north of the, of the Dead Sea, where they would cross the Jordan River from the east, then to enter Canaan. Well, then the king of Arad attacked Israel, although the Israelites eventually defeated him. They took some of his cities captive, looted them, and gave the booty to the Lord as, as, as a payment for a vow. And while this, while looking at, at a map, it, it, it might have made sense for Israel to just go straight north through this conquered king's territory, it would have caused their eventual encounter with the notorious Sea Peoples, aka the Philistines, and something the Lord that the Lord didn't want them to uh, to do. He wanted them to avoid that. So let's read from Numbers chapter twenty-one, starting at verse four. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page one seventy-three. Starting at verse 4 of Numbers chapter 21. Then they traveled from Mount Hor on the road towards the Sea of Suf in order to go around the land of Edom. But the people's tempers grew short because of the detour. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no real food. There's no water. And we're sick of this miserable stuff we've been eating. And in response, Adonai sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people, and many of Israel's people died. And the people came to Moses and said, We sinned by speaking against Adonai and against you. Pray to Adonai that he rid us of these snakes. And Moses prayed for the people, and Adonai answered Moses, Make a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. And when anyone who has been bitten by it sees it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And if a snake had bitten someone, then when he looked at the, towards the bronze snake, he stayed alive. The people of Israel traveled on, and they camped at Avot. And from Avot, they traveled and camped at Iye Havarim, in the desert uh, fronting Moab on the east. And from there, they traveled and camped in the Wadi Sered. And from there, they traveled and camped on the other side of the Arnon, in the desert. This river comes out of the territory of the Amorites, for the Arnon is the boundary between Moab and the Amorites. This is why it says in the book of the wars of Adonai, Vahev a Sufa, the wadis of Arnon, and the slope of the wadis extending as far as the site of Ar, which lie next to the territory of Moab. From there they went on to Be'er, and that is the well about which Adonai said to Moses, Assemble the people and I'll give them water. Then Israel sang this song. Spring up, O well. Sing to the well sunk by the princes, dug by the people's leaders, with the scepter and with their staffs. And from the desert they went to Matanah, and from Matanah to Nachliel, from Nachliel to Bamot, and from Bamot to the valley by the plain of Moab at the start of the Pisgah range, where it overlooks the desert. Israel sent messengers to Sichon, king of the Amorites, with this message. Let me pass through your land. We won't turn aside into the fields or the vineyards. We won't drink any water from the wells. We will go along the king's highway until we've left your territory. But Zechon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. Instead, Zechon mustered all of his people. He went out into the desert to fight Israel. On reaching Yachatz, he fought Israel. Israel defeated him by force of arms and took control of his land from the Arnon to the Abok River, but only as far as the people of Ammon, because the territory of the people of Ammon was well defended. Israel took all these cities. Israel lived in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and all its surrounding towns. Heshbon was the city of Sechon, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and conquered all his land up to the Arnon. This is why the storytellers say, Come to Heshbon, let it be rebuilt, let Sechon's city be restored. For fire burst out of Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sichon. It consumed Ar of Moab, the lords of Arnon's high places. Woe to you, Moab! You are destroyed, people of Chemosh. He let his sons be fugitives, his daughters captives of Sichon, the king of the Amorites. We shot them down. Heshbon is destroyed all the way to Devon. 
We even laid waste to Nofach, which extends as far as Medva. Thus Israel lived in the land of the Amorites. Moses sent men to reconnoiter Yatzer. They captured its towns and drove out the Amorites who were there. Then they turned and went up along the road to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, marched out against them, he with all of his people, to fight at Edrei. Adonai said to Moses, Don't be afraid of him, for I have handed him over to you with all his people in his land. You will treat him just as you did Sichon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they struck him down with all of his sons and all of his people until there was no one left alive. Then they took control of his land. The only reasonable route that was open to Moses was called the Way of the Sea of the Reeds, or Yom Suf. And in modern, time, uh, modern terms, this was a well-traveled highway that skirted the western edge of Edom and ended at the northernmost tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, that finger of the, of the Red Sea. It separates the Sinai from the Arabian Peninsula. Now that route was among the most difficult of this wilderness journey. It was hot, it was rugged, it was merciless. Those leaders who had been in the prime of their lives when they left Egypt were now elderly. They were weary from 40 years of living like Bedouins. Those who were elderly when living in Egypt were now dead and buried. The Israelites openly questioned Moses' choice to go around Edom, a journey that would add at least a month through some of the worst terrain imaginable. The common Israelites were neither stupid nor uninformed. There seemed to be no good pragmatic reason to take this arduous route around Edom because they all well knew that the nomadic militia of Edom could never have stopped this enormous 600,000 man army of Israel from passing through it. The show of force that Edom had made earlier was just that, a show of force and probably it was a bluff. They didn't attack Israel, they didn't inflict any kind of damage upon them and that was recorded anyway, but the threat achieved its effect. Even more, Moses recognized the natural kinship of the Edomites, and he didn't want to inflict grave damage on them because they were a relative. In a few days after turning south, the people became depressed, they became disillusioned, angry, and now they speak out against Moses and against Jehovah. They had learned, if they'd learned anything by now, it seems, you would have thought they would have recognized it was folly to speak against Moses and to imagine that in doing so in no way involved God. And when they rebelled against God's mediator, they rebelled against God. So they openly griped, not just about Moses, but also about the God who had redeemed them from their Egyptian oppression. The gripes, the usual argument. Ah, things were better back in Egypt. Why would you disrupt us? Why would you bring us to this horrible place? Just allow us to die out here. But this time they took one more bold step in their rebellion. They said they had come to hate the food. The bread from heaven. Manna that the Lord had been providing for them for 40 years. They said they're sick to death of that stuff. Well, in response to this lack of gratitude and trust, the Lord sent poisonous serpents to bite them, and it killed many Israelites. So here we see that despite the rebellion, a certain maturity and understanding of the people of Israel had occurred. They recognized instantly that the serpents were a divine plague that was sent upon them, and that their only hope of survival was to plead with Moses, their mediator, to intercede with God on their behalf. Finally, they understood that Moses' position was without equal. It was irreproachable. There weren't multiple mediators. There was no democratic solution to this. 
even more that people had come to realize the other vital principle of redemption and forgiveness of sin, the absolute necessity of repentance. Now, I hope you played, paid close attention when we move through Exodus and then Leviticus, and now we're most of the way through Numbers because it has exposed this principle. Ritual without trust and repentance is ineffectual. Over and over, God says it's the condition of the heart that matters. Over and over again, it is made clear that the various rituals of atonement and of purification weren't a matter of uh, magic. They were a matter of obedience. Ritual by itself accomplishes nothing. Ritual by itself, without the confession of wrongdoing, trust in the Most Holy One, possession of a contrite spirit, are indeed nothing but worthless mechanical acts of self-righteousness. And I want to make it as clear as possible to all who are listening, because it's hurtful to me, the way Hebrew history and liturgy and the Torah itself has been so maligned and, 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 and misrepresented and distorted. There was no general belief among the Hebrews that robot-like obedience to the law brought a good and proper relationship with God. It's not true. This is an erroneous concept of a works righteousness that is invariably attributed to the Jewish people by, by Christianity simply out of some kind of prejudice. This was not the norm in Israelite culture. Even more, there wasn't any belief in general that their reward for doing the law was any more than simply pleasing God. That was the reward. Of course, I can't deny that such thoughts and practices didn't exist among a minority of Hebrew, that they might have felt they would gain something. But it was not the ways of the mainstream teachers or followers of the God of Israel. Now, let me say this in another way. This belief that's almost universally assumed to be true, that the Old Testament was a works-based method of attaining salvation that required no faith and was later replaced with a faith and grace-based redemption called the New Covenant that declared works to be bad, works to be irrelevant. This is just inaccurate. It's not biblical. First, salvation didn't mean to an ancient Hebrew what it means to today's followers of Christ. Salvation for them meant that Israel would become a world power from which the laws of the God of Israel would then become the universal stand, uh, uh, standard for all mankind. Salvation was similar to what happened to Israel when they left Egypt. It was an escape from the oppression of an earthly oppressor in order to establish a kingdom of God on earth in Canaan. There was no thought, there remains no thought, that if they obey the law, they'll go live with God in heaven. The Hebrews obey God because they love Him. They obey His laws because the best thing in life for them is to please the Lord. Any kind of eternal reward for being faithful, that's, that's secondary. Now, we can all look to the Hebrews historically and criticize them to one degree or another for slowly and steadfastly focusing on creating and following man-made traditions. What today the church calls faith doctrines. Instead of the principles and laws written down in the Holy Scriptures. I mean, Jesus berated his own people for this. And as believers, we can know with a certainty that despite their love of God, too many Jews have rejected his mediator and his son, Yeshua. And this condemns them in a way that just grieves my heart. However, because Christians have accepted and fostered a, a distorted view of the way that Jews see the Torah and tradition and Judaism, we not only falsely accuse an entire people 
of religious folly and of legalism, we also accuse the Old Testament itself and thereby accuse God, the author of the Word. We accuse God of establishing legalism in the first place, even if it was only for a time, which is the claim of the dispensationalist teachings. Now, I unequivocally tell you today, this is a falsehood, and it's eroded the heart of the church for centuries. It has marginalized the very people who wrote down and protected the Holy Word of God and who produced our Savior. And it's kind of created an enmity between the church and the Jewish people where there ought to be brotherhood, just as what happened between Israel and Edom, Jacob and Esau. Well, let's get back to our story. Moses saw the people's admission of their sin against God, and he also saw their contrite hearts, and so as their mediator, Moses asked God to heal them. So we come upon one of the most difficult now and controversial stories in the Bible, the tale of the brazen serpent hung up on a pole. And we read that when the Israelites looked upon this brazen serpent, their snake bites were healed. Now what makes this all the more difficult is that Yeshua makes mention of this incident. And he even draws a comparison between that and what's going to happen to him in his coming crucifixion. And we read this in John 3.14. John 3.14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And there's that Son of Man reference again that we talked about in our study of the book of Daniel. So what are we to take from this wilderness event? How does this bronze serpent matter? How does this compare to the death of Christ? Well, let's first see what Numbers says happened and why it happened. Jehovah told Moses to make a fiery serpent, to mount it on a pole, and when anyone who had been bitten by this divinely ordered plague of poisonous snakes, when they looked upon it, they'd be healed. And we're told that Moses complied, and he made the serpent out of either copper or bronze, and indeed, looking upon the serpent, healed those who had been bitten. That's about all that's said. Now this ought to immediately be a warning to us not to read more into it than what's here. We shouldn't speculate too heavily. It's been done on a grand scale, by the way, about this passage. But let's begin by examining the phrase about the pole and about the serpent in the original language. The Hebrew says that Moses was to make a seraph. And right there is where the difficulty starts. Because if we turn to Isaiah 6-2, we see this remarkable verse. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And wouldn't you just know it, the heavenly seraphim of this passage is precisely the same word and Hebrew spelling, seraph. It's what it was that Moses hung up on that pole that's usually translated as a fiery serpent. Here's the thing. The Hebrew word for serpent or snake is nachash. It's not seraph. And in neither Numbers 21.8 nor Isaiah 6 is the word nachash used. It's seraph. Is it possible that what was hung on that pole was not a snake, but something else? Since the term seraph is not precisely defined. Well, not likely, because in 2 Kings 18.4, we find another mention. And this was at a time, maybe five to six centuries, after this wilderness incident here in Numbers. Listen to this verse in 2 Kings 18.4. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Because until those days, 
the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Interesting. The Hebrew used for bronze serpent was Nekosheth Nachash. Nekosheth means bronze. And we find our usual Hebrew word for serpent or snake, Nachash. So here in 2 Kings is an independent account that indeed the object placed on the pole in, was in the shape of a snake, in the shape of a serpent, something that looked like a serpent anyway. But this entire incident is very bothersome for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is the serpent is the primary biblical figure for representing Satan from the first chapters of Genesis all the way through Revelation. So, is what we have here a God-ordained, symbolized representation of Satan being hung on a pole that somehow heals snake bites? And is then in the New Testament compared to Messiah's experience on the cross? And who does that comparison? Jesus. Ooh. I quit. <laughs> Yet, when five centuries later, Hezekiah, Hezekiah, destroys that pole and serpent, he's praised for doing that. Let's peel this onion back a layer by understanding what the problem was that caused Hezekiah to take down and to destroy that long-cherished bronze serpent hanging on a pole, a virtual icon of the Israelites' wilderness experience. So the first question is, did Hezekiah do a bad thing or a good thing when he tore it down? Did it please God? Or was it not that much different than spinning upon the cross of Christ? Well, here's why Hezekiah did what he did. In 2 Kings 18, verse 1, we read this. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Further, as we just read in verse 18, uh, as we had just read earlier in 18.4, for until those days, the sons of Israel had burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. The pole in that serpent that Moses had from the wilderness hundreds of years earlier had been kept the pole and the serpent had become an image that the Israelites worshipped. They burned incense to it. And it had become such an important object of worship, they had even given it a name. Nehushtan. But how was what the Israelites were doing in Hezekiah's day substantially different than what had happened out in the wilderness with Moses at God's direction. Even more since Christ equated, at least in some way, his crucifixion with the brazen serpent being lifted up on a pole. I mean, don't we adore the very pole, the cross, that Christ was lifted up upon? What's so different about the pole that God ordained be erected with the seraph on it in Moses' day, as opposed to the same pole used as an object of worship in Hezekiah's day, as opposed to the pole used to execute Jesus that is used today essentially as an object of worship? Tough questions. And the ancient rabbis have some very interesting takes on both the brazen serpent and separately the seraphim that stand that's Seraphim is just the plural of seraph. These seraphim that stand guarding God's throne. 
And please keep in mind that the exact same Hebrew word, seraph, is used for serpent on the pole, here in Numbers, and for the heavenly creatures that translate seraphim. What follows is more or less a summary of the thoughts of several of these rabbis and sages, with a couple of my own thoughts peppered in. First, let's revisit Isaiah 6.2, starting in verse 1 of Isaiah 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, two he flew. One called out to the another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. So what can we say about seraphim, seraph? They are heavenly spirit beings. They're said to have several wings. They stand above the Lord who sits on his throne, and they're so holy and so pure that they're allowed to take the very coals from the heavenly altar. Part of the meaning of the term seraph is burning or fiery, and it comes from this association in Isaiah chapter 6 with the fiery coals of the heavenly altar. So, seraphim are seen by definition as fiery creatures. Now remember, these are spirit beings, so all association with anything physical, fire, coals, all like this, this is figuratively speaking. From this we see they can fly through the air, wings, they can transport back and forth between heaven and earth, and they're allowed the closest access to God. They even were permitted to carry the, these, these purifying coals, in a spiritual sense, from the heavenly altar fire that takes away iniquity and it forgives sins. Seraphim are amazingly holy, powerful, and have tremendous authority, and they're associated with fire. Why? Because one of the purposes of fire, there's two, one is to destroy and annihilate. The other is what? To purify, that's right, to purify. And further, if we compare biblical descriptions of cherubim and seraphim, we find they are generally identical. Some sages have suggested they're just two names for the same thing. In fact, it's likely that while cherubim is the proper name for a particular kind of heavenly being, seraph or seraphim, is more probably more uh, meant to be a, a description of the being. It may well only be describing a characteristic of cherubim, fiery. Others opine that they are two beings of equally high order. They are essentially the same type of being, but they have very different tasks in heaven. Be that as it may, Cherubim and seraphim are a special and high order of heavenly being, something different than what is typically called angels. They are the guardians of God's throne, and they protect his personal holiness. Now, here's where we have to broaden our subject matter just a little bit to include Satan. We are told in the scriptures that Satan began as a very high order of heavenly being. He was among the most beautiful, we're told, the most powerful of heavenly beings. From the Apocalypse, verse 12, 7 through 9, understanding this is not scripture, but it's, it tells you what the mentality was. 
And there was a great battle in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels, and they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent who was caused, uh, called the devil and Satan, who seduced the whole world, and he was cast into the earth, and his angels were thrown down to him. And we'll find that same thing in the book of Revelation. We also find this statement um, as well. We find this startling bit in Isaiah 14, 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. You've said in your heart, I'll ascend to heaven. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So here we have a statement that tells us Satan was in heaven. He was gorgeous, but he was sent down to earth because of his desire to rebel, to actually usurp God. But he didn't go without a fight. Now here's one more verse, and we're getting close to at least putting a couple pieces together. So hang in there with me. This is a familiar verse to most of us, as it's about God dealing with Satan, the serpent, as a result of his deceiving Eve into partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 3.14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now notice that the serpent, Satan, was cursed in that from that day forward he'd crawl on his belly. Now obviously what does that mean? One time he was upright. Otherwise being cursed to crawl on your belly wouldn't have any meaning. And we must never think that Satan was like the first snake on planet earth. The Bible makes it clear that this serpent was unlike any beast of the field or any other living thing. He was unique. Of all the beasts, this one could speak. Okay, now let me throw one more, one more small bit of information your way. Another very familiar passage probably to most of you. Revelation 12. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there no longer was a place found for them in heaven. See, here's the thing. In addition to being symbolized as a serpent, Satan is now symbolized as what? A dragon. And obviously this is Satan, and he was higher than angels because it even speaks of his angels. And his fight with Michael that we read about, read about a few minutes ago. So what's a dragon? Well, first of all, the dragon is a mythical creature that goes back to ancient China. It doesn't appear to be part of Middle Eastern culture or lore. These were, uh, rather, there were for sure other god creatures of the Middle East that were generally part man, part beast. They had wings, but they weren't represented as dragons. Dragons were all beast. They didn't have any human element to them. Since dragons had become part of Greek folk, folk, uh, folklore, the Greeks invented their own word for this creature of fantasy. Thus we have the Greek word dracon in the New Testament, which then we turn around and pronounce it in English as dragon. Now, what is it that John had in mind when he chose the word translated into English as dragon in, the, in Revelation? Was it a, myth, a mythical, fire-breathing creature that any Hebrew would have taken as pure fantasy, if they were even familiar with what it is in the first place? There's no record that Jews had any idea what a dragon was let alone that the image of dragons was even in their literature. So it's highly unlikely that a dragon 
is what John had in his mind. I suspect John saw something more within the context of his own culture, his own Hebrew culture, of which the Chinese dragon was not going to be part. The Jewish John would have envisioned something more along the lines of a biblical creature, not something Greek, something evil, something fiery, a spiritual being that could fly. What does that bring to mind? I mean, I see a rather interesting connection between the winged seraphim that stood erect in heaven, the earthly serpent in the Garden of Eden that had been cast out of heaven, who used to be erect, but now he was cursed to crawl on his belly, the seraph that was put onto the pole and held up high into the air and cured snake bites, and the dragon, so-called, dracon, who is Satan, who is fiery, flies with wings, looks like a serpent, and is identified in Revelation as Satan. You see all the connections here? I mean, could it be that the heavenly being that was cast out of heaven was technically a seraph? a seraphim, and it was a rebellious seraph who became known on earth as Satan. It's quite interesting that Yeshua says this about Satan in Luke 10, 18, and he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In Bible, lightning is just another representation of fire. They didn't know it was an electrical charge. It is at times called fire from heaven, as a matter of fact, in the Bible. In other words, Jesus was saying, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a fiery streak through the sky. And we know that a seraphim was a fiery heavenly being. We've been reading about it. As Numbers 21 states, it was a seraph put upon the pole of Moses and held up high. And that the so-called dragon of Revelation, which is identified as Satan, has all the characteristics of the fiery serpent, and it has wings, and it has flying ability. Now, there are a couple of places in the Bible that say that the heavenly being that was kicked out of heaven was a cherubim. But as I said earlier, when you compare the descriptions of a cherubim and a seraphim, they're virtually identical with just the possibility that their duties were different. And likely, seraph, indicating fiery, is a characteristic of, cher of, of cherubim, or maybe a type of cherubim. Now I'll throw you one more curveball. In the ancient era, it was common that amulets of poisonous insects or, or dangerous animals were used to counteract the bite or a sting of a poisonous creature. So, if a scorpion bit you, a sorcerer might perform a ritual over you, over you using a scorpion symbol. It's interesting that while we, of course, find this as a laughable superstition, in the modern era, the medical establishment uses the venom of a poisonous creature to inject into a person who's been bitten or stung in order to counteract that poison. It really is the same principle. It's just that one is spiritual and the other is physical in its nature. Now back in Egypt, in addition to indicating royal authority, a serpent was seen as a symbol of both fertility and healing. That is how Israel, at this time, in their wilderness journey, that's how they would have thought of a fiery serpent. And in fact, it was for the purpose of healing of snake bites that God ordered the serpent to be fashioned and then put up on a pole. So, for the Israelites to see a serpent symbol as healing them from snake bites, would have seemed about par for the course. That wouldn't have seemed strange to them. We don't read about Israelites going, why would you do that, Moses? You know why? It made all kinds of sense to their minds. 
So what are we to take from all this? First, the seraph symbol put on the pole did not of itself heal anything. People didn't touch it. As far as we know, there was no ritual performed with it. It was not a magic object, but it was a familiar object. Even the outward principle of its use was familiar. However, it was simply the looking upon it in trust that first began with confession and repentance. That's what healed. Second, at the least, the seraph on the pole has messianic overtones because Yeshua gave it a messianic attachment. And at the least, the messianic meaning is that just as the seraph would be nailed to a pole and hung up into the air, so would Christ. Thereby, he was predicting his own crucifixion. Now, how much beyond the comparison of merely being nailed to a pole Yeshua meant to communicate is pure speculation that frankly has led to an awful lot of allegory. Now there's been some inter other interesting theological thoughts about this, but it's hard to assign these thoughts to more than just speculation. For instance, that when the serpent was put up on the pole, the purpose was not really to look at the serpent, but to look through the serpent as you look up to heaven. And that it was essentially the same thing with Christ. That, that his body, that, that human part of him, wasn't the critical object. Rather, it was looking in faith through his body towards the heavenly throne of God. Maybe. Another standard teaching is that just as men dying in sin are saved by means of a man, Yeshua, dying on the cross, so are men dying of snake bites, saved, healed, by a snake held up on a pole. Maybe. Yet another is that because the serpent on the pole was made of bronze, probably copper, it had to be, what color? Reddish. And red symbolizes blood in the Holy Scriptures. So it was prophetic of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross years later. Maybe. I mean, I could go on and on. Because that's the problem with allegory and speculation. I mean, you can sit here and attach meaning to something via almost any kind of poetic similarity that we can think up. It's, it's never-ending. The only solid connections we see from the Bible about this strange incident are that sin is going to be dealt with by some kind of God-ordained object being nailed onto a pole and lifted up into the air. That much we can see. In Moses' era, it was the seraph, and the sin that was being dealt with was the people's rebellion for griping against God and griping against Moses. Another solid connection is that people would look upon that object on the pole and they would experience some kind of very real healing. Again, in Moses' era, it was looking upon that fiery serpent. In Christ's era, it was looking upon him. And in both cases, it required repentance, a kind of very deep trust. And beyond that, I'm not sure we can attach much more significance. Now, actually, I find the more informative and concrete aspects to the story of the brazen serpent to be the biblically-based connection between the seraphim, the heavenly seraph, the serpent of the Garden of Eden, Satan, the seraph on the pole, the fiery serpent, and the dragon of Revelation that was cast out of heaven. For that, there's a pretty major connection. Now, let me end this segment on the fiery serpent with this thought. Perhaps the most pointed lesson that we can take from this story concerns the all too often gradual kind of frog in a kettle progression from something being a God-ordained 
symbol to it becoming an object of worship, idol worship. Nothing could be clearer than that that fiery serpent on the pole was divinely instructed. It was pure and it was good. And the only thing Moses and the people could do was to obey and then receive healing. Not because it was this metal object, but because it was their obedience to God. Yet there's nothing to indicate, and here's the point, that this was more than a one-time solution to a unique and specific problem. A plague of snake bites due to their rebellion. The serpent on the pole wasn't to become a general symbol. It wasn't to become a talisman to be used for any kind of general healing they sought. We've seen God do this at other times. Moses was one time told to hit a rock to give up water. Another time he was told to speak to a rock to produce water. That doesn't mean Moses was now to assume that every time Israel needed water, he would just decide on his own to go around looking for a promising boulder and whack it. Or yell at it. Nor was Israel supposed to be on the lookout for a rock formation. Oh gosh, that looks like the one we did before. Oh, this has got to be a good one. And they sure weren't to burn incense to it. And they weren't to begin a rock worshiping cult. We saw that apparently the brazen or the fiery serpent on the pole was kept by the Israelites as an active icon for at least five centuries after the Exodus. There is no indication that God intended Israel should have done that. No indication that there were other incidents of healing that involved that pole and that serpent. But people being people, Israel hoped they had found a magic charm for healing. They could use it whenever they wanted to. People got ill and injured all the time. And just like today, people will do pretty much anything to have their suffering relieved, to have their bodies healed, their lives extended. And so the Hebrews kept that pole with the bronze serpent on it, and eventually they began to honor it, they began to venerate that pole and that serpent in hopes that if they paid homage to it, it would bring about healing. The fault in all of this was that they adored the object instead of the one who can actually heal, the God of Israel, who has no form at all. King Hezekiah finally realized this, and he destroyed what began as a fully authorized, one-of-a-kind, but one-use only, divinely, uh, divinely ordained instrument of God. But through misuse over the years, it had become a worthless, an ungodly object of false worship, sorcery, idolatry. What a big lesson there is in this for all of us. Please rise.